you may be seated, everybody. Debbie Essien, will you please come to the platform? Debbie Essien. She was there just a moment ago. She was there just a moment ago. She went round because she thought I meant out there. Okay, so you, sir. You, sir. You, sir. You, sir. You, sir. So somebody else will have to do the, do the talking. Debbie, oh, you're just saved by the, he was saved by the skin of his teeth. Debbie, 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 how are you? Now, Talking Hands Fellowship is here. And uh, when I was uh, watching and listening, I kind of thought that the last bit, we lift our praises up, was quite easy to say. So take it, take it slowly and show me. We lift our praises up to you. Okay. Now stop having a conversation. <laughs> You're supposed to be teaching me now, okay? We, we start slowly. We. we. Now you did a kind of cross there. We. Or is that just a bit of flourish? Is that a bit of pulpit, pulpit affectation? Like my rolling of my R's, is it? Okay. We. we. Mm hmm. Our praises up to you. Okay, let's try again. I should get a hang of this because it's a bit like ballet, isn't it? Okay. All right, all together. I'll follow you. Do it together. We, our praises up to you. Okay, let's all do it together. Stop, stop, stop. I wasn't ready. <laughs> okay. We, our praises up to you oh so so wonderful okay thank you very much welcome to uh, to talking hands and the balletic version of that is we Lee, uh, pr our praises up to you <laughs> Great, it's great, it's great to have you. I still want to see you after the service, Debbie. Uh, that, great, fantastic. So, last night, Ben and Friends was absolutely amazing. We had Kelly Bryan from the band Eternal, one of the most successful R&B girl bands ever, and she told a story that's been not available anywhere else. She just opened her heart. What a wonderful thing to see, people being effective in media. And, and in the arts and talking, talking about Jesus. And Ben uh, has been hosting that and his CD is available. I'm going to hold this very steady so the cameraman will not have the problem he had at 9 o'clock looking at it. Okay, 3, 2, 1, that's enough. Okay, so Ben and Friends, this is a, an EP with five tracks on it. Turn around, feel good tonight, your love can't stop sunshine. These are all hit songs. These made it to the top ten and many of them were number one songs. And you hear all this stuff and some Christians involved in it and you kind of think, well, okay, they're doing their thing, they're going to business as usual, it's their day to the office. But it was never just like that for Ben. All of the songs that he wrote, and the first song, Turn Around, was actually written for him, but it was God speaking to him, talking about life situations which were for him parables. Uh, heavenly, uh, earthly stories with heavenly meanings and uh, he st strings it together and this is so inspirational when you know what's behind the song you know the, the Bible believing Christian shining his light for Jesus and receiving revelation out there in the marketplace uh, but because of course it's all pop hip music it will be useful for those of your friends and most, most people have heard the songs somebody who's 10 years old when the first song came out oh, I don't know what that song is listen to oh yeah I know that song so it's familiar and it's a great witnessing evangelistic tool as well as actually I know I'm so modern and I'm so hip and I'm with it and all the rest of it it's actually quite inspiring so there it is 4.99 is is the price of that and uh, I don't know where we are now we should be live to the coronet and uh, there is uh, a very special host at the coronet this time 
in the absence of Christian Lythe, who has been turning Marseille upside down with Dax and the Creative Ministries team and IBIOL, uh, preaching the gospel, performing in a Catholic church, um, wonderful opportunities. Uh, so in the absence of Christian Lythe, over there in the coronet, we have Bruce Atkinson, who is hosting over there. So welcome to Bruce and to all those watching in the coronet. And uh, for Coronet viewers who may miss the opportunity that we get in the Central Church of buying the best of Christian literature and publications, happening to be, of course, and not that I'm biased in any way, from one of our best preachers and teachers here in Kensington Temple, Mr. Bruce Atkinson himself. No more law. And if you there in the Coronet do not have your copy, repent immediately. <laughs> and get your copy. I think it's still at the introductory price, which lasts till the end of May, so quickly get your copy of No More Law. And uh, I forget how much it is. Somebody will tell me? Four ninety nine. did you say? <laughs> Gabriel, whose side are you on? I can't... Twelve ninety nine. Wow. Yeah, nine ninety nine is the special introductory price. Oh, I've said it now. Nine ninety nine it is. Sorry, Bruce. Okay, and I'm particularly interested in mentioning this song, this uh, because over the last couple of weeks I've been entering into dialogue through my Facebook on a question that somebody asked about the law of Moses, and I've had replies and interaction from all over the world, and. It's been very useful and interesting, but also tragic. Tragic that so many of God's people all over the world are still being taught legalistic bondage and have never understood our freedom from the law and what that means to have life and liberty in Christ Jesus. And actually it was one of the people, what did they call it? A friend, yes, one of the friends, one of my likes. As they, as they, I don't know this terminology, I just keep pumping it out and hope for the best, uh, said, by the way, Colin, there is a wonderful book on this by Bruce Atkinson, No More Law. And uh, that will help, help the people understand this. So I thought, that's great. It's really great. They're telling me about it now. So <laughs> it's good that it's getting around. If you don't have your copy, do get your copy because this book is second to none for simplicity and clarity. On, on that particular topic. Um, I know I'm running out of time here, but I've been away for a little while. By the way, it's great to be back in London. Great to be back in Kensington Temple. Oh, it's good to be home. And not that I've had a bad time. I've had a fantastic time. Two big conferences in different parts of Brazil. I was in a place called Ribeiro Preto. So they may be watching. So it's still morning. Bom dia con alegria todos acá. Okay. Deus abençoe Okay, and I think that was Portuguese. If it's bad Spanish, please don't. Don't disillusion me. But it was great to be there. I know some of you are watching over there in, in Brazil, different parts of the world. And I must bring the greetings from the church in Ribeiro Preto, which was a big cell conference there. Ribeiro Preto. Um, and uh, also in Recife with the Bishop Marcelo, who's over there. And uh, that church has now grown to 250 strong, and the new building is nearly finished. We're keeping on working on the new building, which is situated in a key part of the city of, of uh, Recife, which is in um, Perambuco. Ah, I forget, forget my pronunciation. I'll just stick to English. It's somewhere in Brazil. And... Um, <laughs> A, a lot warmer than here, by the way, and their winter makes our summer look shameful, but anyway. And um, the, we're situated right near a favela, which is a very, very poor area, and the leader of the favela has come to Christ. Yeah. Has come to Christ. And uh, an alcoholic, and he's... Uh, uh, dealing with his struggle with alcohol and that is just an amazing testimony and now uh, I can say hundreds of kids that's not true mustn't exaggerate a hundred kids regularly attend but we are impacting hundreds of kids in that in that area and helping them and teaching and training what wonderful expression of the kingdom of God people ordinary honest people finding Christ and being changed and and experiencing redemption and lift 
coming to Christ and your circumstances now becoming under control and so congratulations to, to all of you out there and everybody else who's watching on the internet now you are very welcome God bless you now I want to turn you please to the um, book of, of um, Philippines book of Philippines Philippians just, just, just give me a moment because I haven't this technology you know this machine was stolen from me um, when I was away and I have a new one so I just say blessed insurance that's what I say okay so I am on what am I on quick help me here Gabriel where are you when I need you I am on iBooks uh, iBooks here okay <clears throat> I would like you to turn to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Listen, I'm a bit jet lagged. I only got in yesterday. And it's about, I don't know what time it is for me here, but I'm just happy to be here. Philippians 2. I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. So are you ready? You can follow on the screen. The first verse I will say, but not comment on. I will pause for the Holy Spirit to speak to people here today if you need to hear this do all things without complaining and disputing thank you Holy Spirit that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain shining as lights in a dark place by holding forth the lamp, the torch of God's word. That's our call. And do you know, I know I say this with almost every message I preach. But right now, I cannot think anything that is higher on God's agenda for God's people than his call for us afresh to lay hold of his word and to hold it high as a lamp in a dark place a society that needs more than ever before the light of God's word God's infallible unchangeable irreproachable word rather than the human opinions of men that seem to want to reinvent everything including marriage itself in our generation Psalm 1 turn to Psalm 1 Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3 says Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever he does whatever he does prospers whatever whatever he does prospers if we look at the signs of the times we'll find ourselves very quickly thinking about the apocalyptic scenarios that will hit the earth in the end times we'll get into the book of Revelation no doubt very quickly when we see what's happening in our world around us it seems that there is a kind of crisis that is hitting all the nations I know we live in a global village the globalization but all over the world the same pattern there's a shaking there are global, global problems which are which require global solutions 
taking us further and further into the end time scenario of global control by ungodly rulers. In the economic, ecological, ideological worlds, we see the seismic shift away from the word of God. It seems as if the enemy himself is preparing the world stage for his final onslaught against humanity, unleashing his fury against society itself, hell-bent on bringing disintegration, seeking that which is impossible, of course, but seeking anyway to destroy the church in different nations of the world, including here in Britain. But we know Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of destruction will not prevail against it. But in all of this, we need to understand Satan's chief strategy, which is to attack the word of God, the scriptures. He wants to bring deception. And it's happening in so many different ways. False religion, Islam is a deceptive religion. It's not the only one. New age thinking is permeating almost every area of society. Cults, false beliefs, secular humanism, which is a form of religion, basically saying the religion is we do, do it. We do life without God. We don't do God. We do life without God. And it's showing in the rejection of biblical standards and values at every area of society. And it seems that even protest votes and people who want to say, no, 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 we, we, we need to stay with the biblical principles, their voice is losing any kind of appeal in today's world. But God does have an answer. And you and I, we are part of that answer. God's answer at times like this is to raise up a victorious church, a spirit-filled church, a Bible-believing church, and a Satan-overcoming church in the power of the Word. All over the world, we're seeing great outpouring of the Spirit. The Bible says in the last days, God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And every day, I don't know, at least 100,000 people across the world are coming to genuine faith in Christ. In Britain alone, every, t every course of Alpha program, just that one evangelistic strategy, is yielding 80,000 people coming to Christ every time that is run across Britain. So wonderful things are happening. But in the midst of this challenge, God says your priority is, as never before, to know the truth and to hold the truth up as a beacon of light. Now, over this last week, I caught it on patchy uh, broadcasts on my scratchy television in what was called a hotel where I was staying. Uh, I, uh, and, and uh, you know, my, my internet connection well, anyway, um, it was disconnection more than connection. But I managed to keep up with current affairs and see how that in Greece, in Olympus this week, last week, they lit the Olympic flame and it's on its way to Britain. And people are going to be honored. I think you can pay for the honor. People can be honored who will travel and hold the Olympic torch, carry the Olympic torch, and then keep, keep, keep it if they pay us money and keep it. And that's it. Great honor. Fantastic. But there is... A greater honor for all of us to hold forth the torch of witness of the word of Jesus Christ. And we are all Olympic runners. Grab your Bible. Grab your Bible. Lift your Bible. If it's an iPad, lift the iPad. If it's an iPhone, lift it as an i whatever it is. Oh, you guys, look at you. Look at you. I had to borrow a Bible today because I, too, like you, carry 27 versions of the Bible on this wonderful electronic thing. But it doesn't quite hold. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. And this is my iPad. God bless you. A real man of God. And the only thing I hope for is that, that, that is King James Version, sir. Is it? It is indeed. Something about you made me feel that that was definitely King James Version. But whatever version of the Bible, it is God's Word. And God's Word is truth. Psalm 119 verse 60 says the entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Oh, that people in the 21st century in Britain, in America, in the Middle East, in North Africa, en effet, partout dans le monde, if every single person in the world would grasp that, my, what a word, what a change would happen in our world. The entirety of your word is truth. Very important. 
because even here, even Kensington Temple people are daily coming under the influence of those who say, well, yeah, you have, a, you have a nice faith, but you know, you can't really believe this part, can you? And that part you can't really believe. And what he says about marriage, oh, no, 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 no. It's up to the state to tell us what marriage is. Never. It's up to God to tell us what marriage is. It's up to God to tell us how to live our families. And this isn't an easy way out. It's not like saying, we don't have to think for ourselves because we just have to blindly follow God. No, no, no. There's no blindness in following God. The people who refuse to follow God, they are walking blindly. But when we follow God, we are carrying a light that will lighten our footsteps. The Bible says, God's word is a light unto our path, a lamp unto our feet, because it gives us direction. But the real challenge is taking the responsibility to live in the light of what we see. That's the challenge, to live in the light of what we see. So it says the entirety of your word is truth. We can't pick and choose. And it says every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. And these people who stand in judgment on the word of God, actually, they are speaking their own judgment because we don't judge the word. It's the word that will judge us. And so how important it is to hold this up. I don't know if you remember the question that Pilate asked. Pilate asked Jesus, when Jesus was giving witness and testimony, and uh, Pilate said, well, you're talking about truth, but what is truth? Well, he got the question wrong. He should have asked, who is truth? Because truth is not a philosophy. Truth is not a religion. Truth is not an ideology. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. So he got the question wrong. He asked the wrong question. But the answer to the question, what is truth, is your word. God's word is, tr is truth. John 17 verse 17, Jesus speaking to the Father, asks the Father to help the disciples. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Not just your word is true. Your word is truth truth. Now I know this makes people mad because they say, you know, you Christians, you're so dogmatic. You make these big claims. Everybody else is struggling to think about what is truth and you just stand up with a mindless way and say, the truth is the Bible. And that is a big statement. It's a true statement, but it's a big statement. But when we say the Bible is truth and the Bible is true, we are able to back it up with evidence. I'm not going to talk about that today. So it's not just a question of saying, I blindly accept the Bible. No. When you examine the Bible as it's been examined, like no other religious document has been examined, and it, with every attempt being made to destroy it over the last 200 years, the Bible remains intact and authoritative. And any single person who really wishes objectively to examine the basis upon which we say the Bible is the truth, the word of God, will discover for themselves there is evidence. Now you may not have come to it like that. You may not have come to be, believe in the Bible through doing in university research. Because at the end of the day, it's the conviction of the Spirit who witnesses to our heart and life. But it's not a mindless statement. Now we need to know that when we hold up the Word of God and saying this is the truth, it's not just mere opinion. It's not just our belief. Some people say the Koran is the truth and others say the uh, other religious writings are the truth. No, when you compare these things and look at the evidence available, we are on solid reasonable and experiential ground when we say the Bible is the truth. That's not my topic today, but I think it's something we are looking at in the church and increasingly teaching to show how you can defend your statements of faith. But so we, we, we need to hold forth the word of truth. Now, what does it mean to us? It means that first of all, we need to know what we believe. If we say this is the truth and we're holding it up for others and we don't even know it ourselves where are we and this is a challenge but you know it's time to let the Holy Spirit anoint one part of you that needs anointing 
more than any other part. And that's called your little gray cells. Hello? I know I'm speaking to charismaniacs and pesticostals who never use their brains. Is that Kensington? Does that describe Kensington Temple? No, 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 no. Thank you very much for that. I'm glad you said that. Because we are not anti intellectual. What we understand, however, is that it takes more than intellect to get to know God. But it's time to use these, these gray cells, and to ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our mind and our understanding that we can love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Why? So that we can know the truth. And we're going to have to be prepared to give an answer of those who say, why, why do you believe what you believe? We need to know this, understand the Bible, and be able to explain it and defend it. So there is no excuse, and especially for Kensington Temple people, you have no excuse. Because I don't know any church in London that offers such high quality Bible teaching. No, that I don't know any other church like Kensington Temple for this. I mean, Friday, uh, sorry, uh, five o'clock service is a whole service given out on a Sunday, on a Sunday, not a midweek Bible study, but on a Sunday, on a main worship day, strong teaching so that you can get to grips with it. And, and what about, what about the, uh, the Tuesday evening where you, the Living Free program is all about Bible-based thinking and living and uh, the, the, uh, the teaching for training of cell leaders. And then we have Wednesday and Thursday uh, throughout the term times where you can study the Bible at a level of depth, actually level four. In, in our in educational system and be, be, have a certificate at the end of it. I mean, the topics, I mean, th this week on Wednesday, Sam Solomon is going to come and teach you how you can get to grips with what Islam is about so that you can better reach out with love and understanding to our Muslim friends who are looking for something more than their religion provides them. And that is many, many, many people. We teach you. We train you. Then there's a full-time training program. If you say, I'm tired of learning a bit here and learning a bit there. I want to give a whole year to getting to grips with the Bible. It's there. Every one of you could, theoretically anyway, take a year out to get to grips with the Bible. Or if that doesn't suit you over a period of time, lay hold of the Word of God in those very special teaching times. There is no excuse for Kensington Temple people not to know the Bible. And if anybody says to you, well, you say Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, often popularly quoted, misquoted, Jesus never ever claimed to be the Son of God. That was the invention of the early church. Oh, excuse me. Of course he claimed to be the Son of God. Could you turn to the Bible and show where Jesus himself claimed to be the Son of God? And what was his justification for that? Can you do that? you got to know your faith. Amen. If we say we're holding the torch, what does it mean? Let it illuminate, first of all, your understanding and then your lifestyle so that you can not only explain it and proclaim it, but demonstrate it. Because the best word of all is the word that you are living out with your life. That's what Jesus meant when he said, let your light shine that people may see your good works. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's true. I know it's true. Hallelujah. So know it. Believe it and know why you believe it. And when you put it into practice, something happens. Your life prospers. Is, not that, is that not the promise of, uh, of uh, Psalm 1 and verse 3? Meditating in the law, delighting in the law. Now remember, especially holding a book that says no more law, and the best book on the topic, hold no more law, is the Bible itself. What does it mean for us as believers to meditate in the law? Well, of course, we know that the literal law of Moses, with all of the regulations, stipulations, with all the uh, uh, clothing regulations, dietary regulations, uh, worship instructions concerning just which bit of the animal you offer to God and all that kind of stuff, all of these things are pictures of Jesus. And so when we go to the law, we're not looking at how to bring our lives back under the law of Moses. It's about listening to what the law says to us as spirit-filled believers. And it's all about Jesus. 
And so another way, when you read in the Old Testament, as a New Testament believer, uh, you could, for any statement concerning the law, you can substitute in your understanding the word word. So we meditate on the word of God. And it's the word of God that brings faith. It's the word of God that brings direction. It's the word of God that brings light and salvation and healing and deliverance and prosperity. He, whatever he does, such a person, shall prosper. And uh, God's word is always a prosperous word. Did you know that? God's word is always a prosperous word. There will be a prize here today for the person who is about to tell me what I'm about to say next. Because it's a verse that links God's word prospering. And it's found in Isaiah 55. And it's getting closer. If I have to give you the verse, it's too late. So who can tell me what that is? Nine o'clock, of course, nine o'clock are very studious. Somebody's looking it up in the Bible. I want, don't put it on the screen yet. All right, God's word prospering. What is the verse? Who said that? Were you at the nine o'clock service? He was at the nine o'clock service. You don't count, sir. Well, you count, but not for that. Oh, never mind. Everybody knows that. Here, pass it on to him. All right. Thank you very much. Wow. How amazing. So let's have a look at the verse. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. See, God's word is living, it's active. And because it is living and active, it activates, it brings life to everything that it touches. When God's word touches your life, you're activated. I mean, I don't wish to insult you, what's true of you and true of me, but your life wasn't up to very much before you came to Christ. Do you think it was? Your life was pretty miserable. In fact, you didn't have one. <laughs> you were dead. Do you remember that? You were dead in transgressions and sins, but God's word came and activated you. Amen. Wesley writes a hymn about this. And can it be that I should boast, that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Well, the verse, the verse goes, Ruth Ann's not here to help me, so you, somebody's got to help me in case I, I misquote it. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Thank you very much. We should sing that. Fabio, I want an R&B version of Wesley next Sunday. <laughs> Okay, so what this is talking about is the picture of the human soul, imprisoned in darkness and dead. Okay, but God spoke, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. Well, it's using the picture of sight, God looking, but it really means that God spoke and he spoke a word of light, a word of life. And when that happened, we were made alive. Uh, and, and from that moment onwards, we understand that everything about our lives and living, real living, is about walking in the power and energy of the Word of God, which has activated us and brings us into fruitfulness. So how does this word prosper us? Well, as we receive it in our heart and as we do it. And it's important. It's so important now. That we lay hold of the word of God more than any other time because there's so much opposition to it. The enemy's biggest attack is against the word of God. And if we can withhold that attack 
uh, we, if we're going to withhold that attack uh, and overcome, we have to do it through the word of God. Even Jesus used the word of God when he was defeating the enemy. Three times he, he defeated the enemy by saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And the last time he said, it is written, that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if Jesus used the word of God to defeat Satan, how much more? Should we use the word of God? And there are many, many people. That was before Jesus entered into his ministry. I just wonder, there are many, many people who are not fruitful in ministry yet because they have not learned to defeat the enemy in their own heart, in their own mind, because they have not grabbed hold of the word and they don't know how to use it. So it's time to take up the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, and begin to wield it in the power of the Holy Spirit so that you take your place where God has put you with your sword held high, or if we're still sticking to the picture of this morning, holding the light of God's word, the torch of God's word up, then you can be fruitful and successful. Now in order for this to happen, we've got to have confidence in the word of God. Got to have confidence in it. And I don't know if you feel the same way when uh, you, you know, you're watching television and all these people are pooling their ignorance and you've got the equivalent of whatever there is today, the Jerry Springer show or Oprah Winfrey. And Oprah Winfrey says, so what? She's entertaining. She's not giving truth. She's entertaining. She's not giving truth. Truth doesn't enter there. It's about entertainment. And God's word is not for entertainment. God's word is for instruction. And you want you hold on to the word of entertainment, that's, that's your funeral, that's your business. But if you want to hold on to truth, you hold on to the word of God. And it doesn't matter whether all public opinion comes against the word of God, it's the word of God that's going to prevail. It's the word of God that gives truth. It's the word of God that gives freedom and liberty and life. It's God's word taken into our lives that will teach us how to live, how to conduct our marriages, our families, how to conduct ourselves in business, how to be fruitful and how to be successful in life. It's all to do with the Word of God. And we need to lay hold of this, I think, more than ever before. I've been challenged by the words of Kevin Katzner, who was um, uh, a professor of theology, and, and he, um, quite a few years ago now, asked this penetrating question of a live audience when he was concerned back in 1985 I think it was he was concerned about the low standard of Bible knowledge in his own generation <laughs> and a lot has happened since then we're a long way down the line from that time and he said this do you really believe are you really persuaded that the Bible way is teaching us a way that is absolutely true it's true True, truth, true, true. And also absolutely essential to live a fruitful, satisfied life. Interesting. And unless we are fully persuaded of that, we're not going to hold to the word of God. When somebody comes on with a stronger argument than ours or challenges us, we say, well, you believe what you believe. I'll just follow blindly my own way. Uh, no. God wants us to be fully convinced that when we take the word of God, we have something that is true, that is real, absolutely true, and that will last for time and eternity. One of the greatest prophetic words in all the Bible, to my mind, is in Isaiah 40, where the Isaiah the prophet cries out and says, All flesh is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, and the place knows it any no, no longer. And what is it? What is this grass? The people are as grass. Grass is human opinion. Human opinion is shifting and changing and comes and goes. But Isaiah goes on to say, the word of the Lord abides forever. Do not form your life build your life upon the sands of human opinion get to grips with the word of God and if you said I'm not so sure it's the word of God study and find out that it is go to the bookshop and say Dan I need a book to help me to really get to grips with whether the Bible is truly the word of God 
And if you're still struggling with that, Dan will help you. There's literature, there's books. We've even spoken about that. Bruce did a series on it. And there is so much. But you can't just pretend. You can't just say, well, Kensington Temple believes it, so I'll believe it. What if you leave Kensington Temple? What if Kensington Temple leaves you? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, it's got to be more than based on church attendance and the opinions of your friends. You have to know for yourself because there may come a time when you won't have any of those friends around you. Or you'll be in such a dark situation where nobody can reach you. And you need to know for yourself. And if it's true, run with it. Run with it. Run with pride. Run with confidence. Now, how can we be so sure? We know that God's word is integrity itself. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed. God-breathed. In other words, scripture is God's very word. When it says God-breathed, it's talking about God's word being formed on his breath. Just as my breath now is giving me the capacity to communicate through sound waves. And spiritually speaking, this means that the word of God, that scripture is God's word. It's not human words. It's not man's word. It's God's word. And it's slightly complicated because uh, the Christian scriptures, the Bible that we hold here is God's word through human beings. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved, carried along by the Holy Spirit. They were inspired, uh, but God was using them to communicate in written form exactly what God wanted them to say. So the result is we have a sure word of prophecy. What Second Peter chapter 1 verse 19 says, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain the sure word of prophecy and you do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place and this is talking about the fact that God's Spirit came upon men who were carried along by the Spirit blown along by the Spirit in other words their words were directed by God by God's Holy Spirit Amen it is fully inspired and authoritative. And, and uh, you know, in John chapter 10, verse 35, it says that Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus had a very high view of scripture. And you know, we accept that Jesus is a great teacher. And we accept that Jesus has wisdom. And Jesus himself said, the scripture cannot be broken. And if you think you're breaking the scripture, you'll discover one day it's the scripture breaking you. You can't mess with this. It's like the man who says, I don't, need to I don't need a foundation when I build my house. Build it anywhere I want. I can build my house anywhere I want, anyhow I want. And if I want to build it on the beach, I'll build it on the beach. And he built his house on the beach. The shifting sands of human opinion. And as the tide comes and the tide goes, human opinion is eroded. And one set of opinions gives rise to another second set of opinions and pretty soon the whole thing collapses. And Jesus said, this is the wisdom of those who hear my words and build their lives on it. Nothing will be able to tear that house down. The word of God is solid for your life. The foundation is solid. And it's not about thinking, well, we can pick and choose. Today, what we believe, what we don't believe. Get to grips with the Word of God. Build your life on it. The Word of God is purity and integrity itself. Look at Psalm 12 verse 6. Or, uh, sorry, And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. And this talks about a process that frankly, is difficult for us to understand how God did it, but the fact that he did it is easy to grasp. When he spoke his word, he spoke his word through ordinary human beings. They were not infallible. They were fallible like everybody else. But God spoke to them in such a way that any human, infall any human fallibility was taken out of the process. 
In other words, he so worked in fallible, fallen human beings, giving them thoughts and words, and in the way that they expressed it, it was pure and beyond any human weakness and limitation. That's why half the time these people didn't even know what they were prophesying about. They just spoke God's words in a way that seemed very spontaneous to them. But behind their speaking was a process of divine inspiration, which is really extremely difficult to understand how God did it. Okay, like how did he create the world? That's difficult to understand how he did it, but actually it's basically simple. He said it and it happened. And, and the process between saying and happening is extremely mind-blowing. Don't tell me you haven't got enough in Christian teaching to think about and, and to stretch your mind over and to wonder and to examine and so forth. Of course, we have to keep using our brains, but the framework is this. God moved on these men and they spoke. And when they spoke, the word that came out was like silver purified in a fiery furnace seven times. Pure word of God. Amen. Psalm 18 verse 30. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in Him. Can you see how those two thoughts are connected? You can't say, well, I love the Bible. The Bible will help me in this bit of life, but not that bit of life. The Bible is good for singing and praising songs to Jesus on a Sunday, but when it comes to my business life, the first book I put in my briefcase is my Bible, because this is the real world. No, 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 no. The first book you should take out on a Monday is your Bible, and carry your Bible and its truth, not just in your handbag, or in your briefcase, or in your iPad. You carry the truth of God's Word in your heart, because that's where it really counts. I don't know who I'm speaking to today, but I'll tell you what. There is, there is a business, man or woman, I think it's a man, doesn't matter. I'm not trying to be clever. But there is a business person, and you need to hear this. You've just taken the Bible out of your business. Put it back. What do I, what do I mean by that? I'll tell you what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that you are willing to compromise on a Bible principle and you know you do it and you're just saying, God, you're going to have to understand because if I don't do business this way, then I'm not going to be successful. What a deception is entering your spirit, sir. You need to know unless you get back to the Bible, you will have no business. And that's a word from the Lord, a very serious word from the Lord for somebody. Uh, you know, don't tremble, just receive it. Amen and amen. Because God's word is that dependable. If you want to know how to live your family life, take your Bible out. Don't listen to the latest self-help philosophy or psychology that comes in the cheap paperbacks. Don't just turn to the latest chat show where people get together to pool their ignorance. And, and talk about sweet human reason. You go back to the word of God and let the divine light of God's word lighten up your conscience. And then say, God, given these principles, guide me. I need wisdom of how to apply this in this difficult situation. And God will give you wisdom. Amen and amen. So God's word is also unchangeable and eternal. Psalm 119 verses 89 to 90 says, Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. What this tells us is there are two realms. There is the spiritual realm and the natural and physical realm. And what God is saying here is that if you trust my word, which has complete authority in the spiritual realm, you will learn how to take that authority and bring circumstantial change into your natural daily life so that your life will prosper and you will work against or go against the flow and find my word to be faithful. That's what he's talking about. 
God existed in the heavens or God existed whenever he existed before the heavens and the earth were made and he brought this world into being. He brought your life into being. Therefore he not only has the right or the privilege but he also has the wisdom to tell you how to live it. Amen. Amen. And it's not like you just have to just kiss your brains goodbye because the, the complex problems of modern living mean we have to do some hard work sometimes to search the scriptures and say, God, what is your wisdom in this situation when we're facing so many complicated challenges? Complicated challenges about moral dilemmas. Complicated challenges about how do we rise up as churches and speak to our governments and say, you cannot just kick the word of God out of our society uh, yet knowing of course that we're not the Taliban we're not here to say you believe this Bible or we'll cut off your head we're not like that we know that every person has the has the responsibility as the right have the right to choose for themselves and the responsibility to make the right choice but we're here to help them and the only way we can do it is if our lives are shining uh, ablaze with the light of God's truth and they look at us and say wow it works. Amen, amen. Give Jesus a mighty praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we need to receive God's word as pure and say, God, I'm going to uphold this word. I'm going to look at this word. I'm going to take this word because in this word there is the answer to every need, every question we'll ever need to ask. Not in a simplistic way. You won't find a Bible and a verse, chapter and a verse for everything. But as you dig deep into the scriptures, you'll find solid gold that will be your gift of endurance through every test and every trial in your life. But you need to be connected to this word. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to speak for a moment about that connection. You remember... That I said, truth is not a philosophy, ideology, or a religion. Truth is a person. His name is Jesus. Who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now we need to be connected to him. Who is the truth. If you're going to live by truth, you've got to walk and follow Jesus. Walk with Jesus and follow Jesus. And there are people today who have never made that connection. People who have never said, yes, Jesus, you are the truth. I want you in my life because I want my life founded on truth. You are the way. I want to follow you as the way. You are the life. I want the life that you give. You've never made that connection. Maybe you've heard about it. Maybe you've thought about it. But you've never understood. You have to make that connection. And that connection is only one prayer away provided it's a prayer from your heart to say Jesus I want to be connected with you I, I believe in you I put my trust in you I connect with you now I receive you that's what you have to pray and then the connection begins and then from that moment onwards it's learning slowly by slowly how to live it out and we're here to help you that's what our cell group ministry is about that's what our consolidation ministry is about that's what our encounter ministry is about that's what practically every public service is about to help you grow but you have to make that decision first of all I'm gonna step onto this journey I'm gonna connect with the word of life if that's you I'm gonna lead you in a prayer everybody pray it after me but it'll be especially for you who are connecting to Jesus for the first time. Upstairs in the balcony, downstairs in the lower hall, over the road, there in the coronet, behind me in the consolidation room. Those on the internet, say this after me. It's especially for those who need Christ. But everybody pray it. Lord Jesus Christ, pray it stronger than that. I come to you now. And I understand that I need the light of your word. So I ask you, speak that word over my life that I might live. And therefore, I connect with you by faith. And I say, I believe that you are the word of life. That you died for my sins. You were raised again. And you live evermore. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my guide. 
Be my director. In Jesus' name. Amen. If they had bowed every eye closed, nobody moving around. I just want to pray for those people who prayed that prayer for the first time. I want to give you something, put it in your hand to help you take the next step from here. But you need to identify yourself. You need to say, Colin, please pray for me. You just don't have to shout out, but you can just lift your hand right where you are and I'll pray for you. Thank you. God bless you at the front. Anybody else who's saying yes to Jesus today? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Consolidators, please be around. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you there. Upstairs, please keep help me on the platform. Everywhere around this building, keep lifting your hand. Somebody will come to you and pray for you in a moment. Watching over there in the coronet, Bruce will be helping you over there. Downstairs in the lower hall, there are people there. Bef- over up there on the internet, you can contact us right now. Every single person who has lifted their hand. Father, I pray for these people who are responding today to this message. And I pray that there would be such a divine, supernatural connection. That it would be so supernatural. Just as Wesley sang, that there would be the light of God's revelation touching people's hearts and bringing resurrection life to them and they'll be connected with the living God and out of that father the the fruitfulness of life and the prosperity of life and success in life and satisfaction in life to the glory of God will be their portion now and forever in the name of Jesus amen and amen give Jesus a big praise everybody hallelujah amen and amen Amen and amen. God bless you. Just before Gabriel gives you the final announcements, I want to give a very, very strong push about next Saturday night because my friend and your friend, the wandering traveler, Gypsy William Lee, will be with us on Saturday night. And it's, a, it, it's being hosted by the, by the Creative Evening. But, and, and when William heard that, he said, Do you know, every, listen carefully, everywhere I have been in recent months, God has granted creative miracles. And he said, you know, I'm so glad I'm doing it on the creative night. I said, you don't have to sing. You don't have to tap dance. You don't have to do stand-up comedy. You certainly don't have to tell jokes against your wife. But you can be here. And he said, no, Colin, it's prophetic. God is going to do creative miracles next Saturday night. I know you've already mentioned it, but I wanted to reinforce that. Okay? Don't forget Ben's CD and don't forget Bruce's book. Amen. If I've left you anything else to say, say it. God bless. Thank you very much, Colin.